Here we go. So um, how we're gonna lay this out, I'm gonna talk about some of the, dig a little bit deeper into some of the theoretical, the eco-physiological processes of carbon dynamics and how those inform our decision making for management. And then Bob's gonna show some real world examples of how those theories and, and principles play out. So first of all, of course, we have sequestration, right? That's something we're gonna thinking about managing. Tree growth, as Bill really illustrated that, and also flux of carbon from live trees into the other pools. And so that's something we can accelerate, um, but it's really measured as this change in carbon storage over time. And I'll show you that it's related to a couple different conditions and properties in our forest, like leaf area, site index, um, and structure. And then we have storage. This is really related to stocking, right? More trees, more occupying more space, you're gonna have more carbon storage. Um, and the other principle here is that bigger trees, because trees are three-dimensional objects, they store more carbon. One thing we have to think about when we're doing active management is that all harvests reduce carbon storage. That's something that is a fact. We're removing carbon in live trees. It does depend on what we're removing, where it goes, so not all harvests produce the same uh, carbon losses. So one thing that is really critical uh, I want to touch on is that sometimes there's this dichotomy, should we harvest or not harvest? and to keep more carbon in the forest. I think all of you are aware of this conversation that's going on in the region, but not harvesting might not have the benefits to the atmosphere as we hope, um, only to this pro principle of leakage, right? So this idea that globally wood harvests, or wood demands are increasing, right? And so if we don't harvest in one place, that doesn't mean that that carbon uh, is gonna be reflected in the atmosphere, that, that reduction in uh, emissions, but that those harvests are gonna com come elsewhere, right? We have demands for wood, it will happen. And so I think this gets into some like, you know, economic, also moral and ethical principles that where force can play a big part in thinking about not pushing our, our impacts elsewhere. So our challenge here is maintaining or increasing um, stocks of carbon over the landscape, right? And so this is something we need to think about that it's a landscape level issue. We are managing on a parcel level, um, but this is becoming increasingly hard. We have forests that are maturing. We have, as Bill showed, more natural mortality, right? We have a lower net uh, growth rate as our, as our trees and forests age. Uh, we also have loss of forest land that influences this, and we also have climate change and disturbances that can really uh, make this goal a little bit harder. Um, so first, when we think about managing on a parcel level for carbon, thinking about setting up goals in a management plan, right? So are you intentionally wanting to uh, manage for increased or enhanced carbon benefits? And then from that, think, do you have a carbon uh, offset program that the land is enrolled in or other sort of obligation, that might change your goals and where you think about managing. So that is a really specific uh, management implication of any of those programs. But even just managing generally for increased carbon benefits, thinking carefully about what other goals do you have for that parcel um, or that land is really important because there are important trade-offs that we'll talk about um, throughout these two days of Things like wildlife habitat, right? Resilience and adaptation of that stand. Certainly things like revenue for the landowner is really critical. So, you know, when we think about carbon management, often it is bifurcated, right? No management, not, and we compare management, but that's not really always the best way to think about it. We really should be thinking about how can I tweak management to enhance carbon benefits from what I would have done otherwise. So we, you know, in the carbon offset parlance, this is like business as usual or something like that. Um, so it doesn't have to be necessarily managed compared to no management because of leakage, right? So we wanna consider harvesting, continuing to harvest over the region, uh, steady supply of products so we don't push our impacts elsewhere, but tweaking management to get some enhanced benefits, right? So things like reducing carbon losses from a harvest, how can we tweak management? Uh, retaining more carbon on site, uh, enhancing the structure and composition of the stand to provide really long-term carbon benefits, right? So this is really important for sites that might be vulnerable um, to certain disturbances or other uh, potential carbon losses. And then thinking about managing the stand, if possible, 
to produce um, wood that would go into uh, hard, durable wood products. And this isn't always possible for every stand, but if it is, that's a great way to think of long-term management of ways to harvest a higher proportion of those products. And so you've seen this slide before. Um, this is sort of the general balance we have, right, of carbon accumulation via sequestration in living plants and trees, flux of carbon to the different pools. We also have a balance of carbon emissions um, from cellular respiration, metabolism of all living organisms, decomposition of, of organic molecules, and that can break up so much that those molecules can become soluble in water, leach out of the forest, and of course we have forest fire, which can um, re release emissions. But because this is Silviculture Institute, I'm gonna go a little deeper for you all on this. Um, so this is, this is uh, Ecophysiology 101. Um, so really breaking this apart to talk about what we have the power to manage and what we don't is kind of this whole equation for what changes carbon in a forest. So first we have gross primary production. I have a little key here. Um, so that's the net, you know, or that's the total sequestration that's happening by living plants. You do need to subtract respiration from autotrophs. So autotrophs are, are green plants as they metabolize and use the sugars um, and carbohydrates that they've created through photosynthesis they release carbon dioxide back out. And the net is called net primary production or net primary productivity. So that includes tree growth, that includes mortality, branch breakage, turnover of leaves and needles, root turnover, and exudates of carbon um, from the fine roots into the soil. So it's that whole picture of, of carbon um, in the tree. But it's more than that when we look at the forest, because now we have to subtract respiration from heterotrophs. So those are fungi and bacteria, amoebas, all the various things in our forest that are breaking down that organic matter, then releasing uh, carbon dioxide back out. So then we get net ecosystem production or net ecosystem productivity. But they're not done there yet. We also have, as I mentioned, carbon export. This is leaching of carbon um, in aqueous solutions, so that's in water, just naturally happens. We can also have erosion of carbon when we have soil erosion, and certainly things like oxidation, that's mostly fire. You can also have some oxidation from just volatile uh, compounds, which is very small. Um, and that's where we get change in carbon storage over time. So you can see there's a lot going on here that's pretty complex when we're talking about the forest ecosystem. But really when we're talking about managing, we're really focusing on this top part, right? That's what we have the levers to manage. We're managing the live trees. As Bill talked about, we're fluxing carbon from into those larger tree sizes perhaps. Um, we're creating more room for growth of remaining trees. But really what we're measuring is just a small part of this net primary production. We're measuring tree growth and, and maybe mortality, but we don't really have a great way to measure leaf turnover, root turnover, certainly not exudates in the soil, and it's sort of a new science that we're learning about. And we can do things like reducing losses in this um, category, so reducing soil erosion, reducing fire, or maybe even uh, increasing uh, incidence of fire through controlled burn. So when we look at uh, net primary production, we can see, as you know, Bill talked about this with sequestration, same idea, right? So we have this peak in sequestration when stands are fairly young. For in the temperate forest, it's about 50 to 80 years old. But I do want to show that it's not the only thing that affects net primary production. This is showing net primary production just of the wood, because again, that's sort of what we can measure. But I just want to show that there are a number of different factors that correlate, so these are correlation coefficients, with wood growth. And so those are things like uh, leaf area index here, which is basically a measure of leaf area to ground area, so it's a measure of photosynthetic capacity. Um, things like rugosity, which is a measure of canopy complexity. It's really that vertical, horizontal arrangement of leaves in the canopy. And I will say, and, and site index is really important too. Um, so we can see that there are levers here, if we think about forest management, 
you know, promoting rugosity, promoting complexity, promoting leaf area index, and, and occupying the space um, can really help with that net primary production of wood. I will say that there's a huge percentage here that is just unknown, kind of unmeasured things. <laughs> so there is a lot of variability, which I think Bill pointed out really well. Just, you know, we, we're still learning a lot about carbon dynamics and really what influences um, its outcomes. And so we see, you know, as I mentioned, this rugosity is a really important uh, concept. I think that's really cool. And it will play into what probably Tony will talk about tomorrow with adaptation and resilience of this idea of complexity. So each three of these letters are different plots with very similar leaf area indexes, um, but they have different rugosities um, and therefore different uh, net primary production outcomes. And we see uh, in research that was done across all FIA plots, certainly um, measures of complexity are really important for, for carbon. And so that's a measure of tree size and height and number of species. But we can think about manipulating this uh, to increase carbon benefits. And so, you know, I think I just wanted to touch on this before I touch on the dynamics that we know about in, um, in, in forests. But I've sh I have these slides that you, probably many of you have seen. And I just really want to, I'll touch about a little bit more about this. But you know, we don't want to overly focus on sequestration or storage. right? We need both of them. And I think sometimes these graphics have created this, oh, we're going to manage this forest just for sequestration. We're going to manage this forest just for storage. right? Forests provide both. And so when we think about goals, think about how to enhance both of those benefits. I think it's really uh, important and important in our messaging to, um, to the public. So when we think about this dynamic of sequestration and storage, one really important thing, and Bill touched on this, is that early in stand regrowth, when we have something like a dist widespread disturbance, a clear cut, we do actually have a reduction in carbon storage and an increase in emissions. I will just say that I show these, uh, the y-axis in reverse to how Bill showed it. So positive numbers here are emissions, negative numbers are sequestration. Um, that is a funky thing we sometimes do with carbon, uh, but I represent it as a mitigation potential. So you're the negative numbers, you're taking that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it's showing across these forest types, um, there is an initial early emissions. Um, these, so these forests are net sources of carbon dioxide early in stand regrowth. And so I'll show you how this, this plays out. Right? So early in stand um, development, when we don't have, there's no live trees at the site. All the live trees are gone. Right? But we have carbon in our soil and our leaf litter and our dead wood. We actually have a decline in carbon storage in that first five years uh, of that stand being regrowing. And you can see in this uh, green, the green bar, trees are growing. They're just really small, and so that sequestration of live trees is too small to overcome what we're seeing are actually decomposition of these other pools. So they're decomposing faster than new carbon can be pulled into the site. And that actually only lasts a short amount of time as this wood volume increases and the trees on the site start growing. We see that now this site is accumulating carbon over time, and that you know, occurs and continues through the life of that plot, bearing no other disturbances. So showing what that looks like with carbon flux, again, negative numbers, sequestration, positive emissions. Between years one and uh, zero and five, we have a net of uh, emissions here on this site. Again, it's because we do have sequestration in these living trees, but that um, decomposition in these dead wood and so forest floor pools is much bigger. And they're not getting new inputs, right? So there was an initial very big input of leaves, needles, dead wood. Um, and so there's a, a pulse of decomposition that's happening. And so this forest is a net source. And as we go through time, in the next 10 years, now we're finally seeing that this forest is a net sink. But you see that we still have um, a lot of emissions, net emissions from these other two pools, right? There's not enough uh, dying little trees yet. They're still growing. You haven't really gone through stem exclusion phase. Next, we have at 25 years that we have um, forest sequestration continues to increase, 
Finally, we have the forest floor is accumulating as those trees get bigger and are able to drop more leaves and needles um, and build up that forest floor pool. And it isn't until um, the 35 year mark for this specific forest, and this is um, really just illustrating this pattern, that we see peak forest sequestration, right? So peak tree sequestration happened back at 25 years, but forest wide, when you incorporate all those pools, it doesn't occur until the 35 year mark. And then you see as that forest matures and ages, we do see uh, a decline in, in forest wide sequestration over time. So the magnitude of those carbon losses following something like a clear cut harvest uh, really depend on the amount of carbon removed that was showing a full complete removal of all live trees. Um, and it does depend, and Matt will be talking about this, the percent allocated to different products, right? Because not all of that carbon is gonna be immediately emitted. Uh, the extent and uh, intensity of disturbance to the forest floor. So this is really um, critical and that's what we see um, as some of the source of those emissions early on. Bill illustrated this really well that it's not very easy to assess. We don't measure that. And certainly in carbon market programs, they're not measuring that. And then this really important, and this can really inform our management, is this delay in sequestration um, that occurs, right? So thinking about residual trees in your stand, that can lead to more sequestration directly after a management event, right? And presence of advanced regeneration, not having to wait uh, for seedlings to repopulate that stand, that takes time for them to uh, sequester a sufficient carbon. And this question always comes up, is it possible to uh, catch up from a clear cut to a no harvest scenario. And this again is, is really model data, um, but showing a clear cut at 65 years. Um, and you do get an increase in sequestration following, right? You have younger trees um, that are really growing tall and growing fast. And so relative to the no harvest stand, you have a faster rate of sequestration, but it, it's really hard to match that no harvest scenario. And that's why we need to be careful about thinking about what are we comparing our management to, right? Thinking about comparing it to what we would have done otherwise um, is a, maybe a more helpful way to think about those enhanced carbon benefits. Um, of course, this assumes that there's no disturbances in that unharvest stand. And that unharvest stand has this trajectory of increasing carbon over time. What if it's unhealthy? What if uh, it experiences emerald ash borer? Uh, what if it's a, you know, a monoculture beach stand, right? And so there's many examples where we can think about the harvest scenario could easily um, enhance its resistance, resilience, um, composition relative to that no managed stand. Um, and Matt will talk about this, and it, which is very important, is thinking about incorporating wood products. And this is really hard for us to do. We don't have a lot of information about where the wood goes, what it's used for, but a couple take homes here is that not all of the carbon that's harvested is emitted, right? We measure that as a loss of carbon in the forest, but depending on where it goes, some proportion gets stored. And we also get a permanent carbon benefit when we use wood in replacement of other uh, products. And that's something that's really you know, squishy to co compute, um, but is really important when we think about using wood over, over imported concrete or steel. All right, so I'm just going to end with management implications and then pass it on to Bob. So you know, minimizing carbon losses, reducing that natural mortality, um, especially on these disturbance prone sites, uh, site trees in poor health. Uh, Stem exclusion phase can be a really good opportunity to enhance the growth of the remaining trees. Uh, places where we see that the forest is prone to forest health issues, right? We might get better carbon benefits um, in those sites. Retention is really important, especially large trees on the site, keeping some carbon on site, keeping some trees that can immediately sequester carbon after um, timber harvest. Um, using things like morticulture of poorly growing trees, right? Especially large trees that decompose slowly over time. Uh, snags and girdling trees can allow for a periodic input of carbon. Um, and certainly things like minimizing impacts to soil and forest floor. 
I, you know, again, this is hard to measure, not included in carbon offset modeling and programs, but it's really, really important when we think about the total carbon uh, benefits of our forests. Um, and then, of course, long-lived wood products are key. And so in, in thinking about how can I increase the sequestration potential of the regrowth, so retaining heavy, vigorous tree, healthy, vigorous trees, uh, keeping uh, advanced regeneration on the site, so that is really critical uh, to kickstart that um, sequestration, promoting stand-wide leaf area index, complexity, species diversity, all of these things uh, relate to better carbon storage and sequestration. And using timber management as a tool to increase diversity and complexity, so we get these you know, long-term carbon benefits. So we're thinking about you might get the best benefits for carbon on these sites that are really prone to disturbances, that are, uh, need some restoration, that have po poorly growing trees, right? How can you enhance the benefits of those sites in particular? All right, so now Bob is gonna talk about some case studies. Well, thanks for inviting me here. This is great. Um, about the end of my career, I started deciding to, te we, this new carbon thing came along, right? I thought I knew silviculture, but I didn't understand this very well. So even though I've been teaching production ecology, and I always learn best by examples, right? So, and I could go on and on all day about silvicultural principles and systems. Instead, what we're gonna do is talk about three case studies that illustrate all of these patterns. So, uh, so let's get specific here. I mean, okay. We're going to go to Wikipedia Woods, which is a property that J Jess and I acquired, uh, oh, 2015. Had had no treatment since about 2000. This, th but this had a long record uh, of stewardship by foresters, by us and my previous owner, Ron Locke. Very productive place. It's on a, a south side of a drumlin in Sebec, Maine, which is exactly dead center in the state. And you know we're very proud of the. It's one of the only two forest uh, stewards guild model forests in the state. So, um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, tree farmer, we we're of course very proud of this. There's Ron on the left, uh, Jess and I standing by a nice pine tree, um, and we have lots of data on this property. The, the first the silviculture. Um, I've become for a year, you know, a decade or more now, a big believer in irregular shelterwood kind. It's so flexible, right? There's the three different variants of it. It's really the way to go to manage our diverse forests in New England, certainly up in the Acadian region. Uh, because there had been no activity on this lot, we did have a, a couple years after we acquired it, we had a good sized timber sale. We cut uh, over 1,700 cords, about $60,000 worth of stumpage revenue. They, we had noticed from this property been inventoried many different times, and we had noticed from the, our inventory and the previous one that a lot of really valuable old white spruce and white birch were dying, as well as the fir was infected by the adelgid. So we, Jess and I, laid this out, laid out the trails, marked all the wood except for fir. We typically not d do that. I guarantee you that storing carbon and as a product, never came up once. Um, that, but that doesn't mean we weren't uh, focused, laser focused on the more traditional silviculture, capturing mortality, right? The birch and the fir primarily and the spruce, leaving eggs, right? And getting rid of the Uggs. I've always been a, one of these paint gun foresters. If I, if I got a five, you know, I can get $5 a ton for pulpwood of some kind, it's, and it's crooked, it's never gonna be an ag, it's gonna have blue paint on it, right? Um, it may be perfectly healthy, and you'll see that I, my views have changed a little bit about this for reasons having to do with carbon. Um, and we also, this property, because it had not been much regeneration on it, it was sort of growing old and mature, which is highly stocked, but arguably not sustainable in the long run. And plus, the, because of it, the light harvest history, it's the usual thing of fur and beach in the understory. So we used a bunch of NRCS money to get rid of that. You'll see it here in a minute. Um, th three case studies, stand one is a, is a sort of a softwood, SH mixed wood stand, mostly fir and cedar. The second one is an old growth sugar maple stand with 10 species actually, dominated by the big maple, it was an old uh, sugar bush, never cleared for agriculture. And the final one is a young, immature, completely different than these others, uh, old field uh, stand, almost pure white ash. We're gonna look at what we did to those, the carbon consequences, and then uh, draw some conclusions. So you're going to see a short video of each of these. You're going to see the structure graphically, and then you're going to see 
the, the, the patterns of carbon with and without harvesting, and in a couple of cases, how we tweaked it after the fact to get a uh, thing. So here we go. Okay, we're in our stand one, which was pre-harvest, uh, a softwood dominated stand, fir and cedar primarily, with some large emergent white pines. We had a big timber sale here in 2017. We had noticed from inventory data that the, the fir was heavily attacked by balsam woolly adelgid. A lot of valuable paper birch that had been grown by the previous owner was dying because uh, it was 120 years old probably. So we targeted this stand. We cut all of that here and marked maybe 20 to 25% of the UGG quality red maple and hardwood growing stock and some cedar. Okay, so the basal area started at 148. This is all size classes. The plots here are highly variable, range from 80 to 230. The residual basal area was 66 by the time we all the fur was gone, etc. As a 55% removal, because the the fur logs and the birch, uh, bolt wood and saw logs were valuable, we made $856 per acre here. So this was a valuable removal. But we're now uh, left with a highly irregular stand. It's exactly what you would strive to do in this kind of situation where you really had no choice. The fur was going to die anyway. So you end up with these patch, this patchiness. We're standing in one of the most open areas in the stand uh, at the intersection of two uh, cut-the-length harvest trails, which are dominated still by raspberry to some degree. Um, where the basal area is probably only about 30. Four of the 12 plots in here were under 40 square feet. Four were, were highly stocked, so high, high degree of spatial irregularity. Um, we also, because I was worried about regeneration, we did plant white pine. Uh, this, these are six-year-old white pine, so they're looking at the result of six growing seasons here. I do see I look out in the raspberry patches, I do see some paper birch and some other red maple stuff sprouts finally emerging above the raspberries. But clearly, if you look at the overstory, the overstory is not fully stocked here. The 66 square feet is, is probably, what, 25% relative density. So classic two-aged, irregular shelterwood, where the, where the big old trees, the pines and the red maples, are probably 100, 110, 120, and... There is a mid-story cohort here of red maple and pine. There's a younger pine there, probably 60. And new regeneration, both natural and uh, the planted pine just in the gaps. Okay, um, so here's the pre-harvest stand structure. This is my, of the one, all the graphs we can make of trees, right, and stands. The, if you stack basal area by two inch classes, not number of trees, BA, which is proportional to leaf area and canopy closure, and then uh, stack them by species, you can really get a good uh, sense of the structure. You can see the green there is the fir, uh, and the blue is the cedar. So that's, this is do the dominant species. Of course, we're in there after the fir, and then there's a, that component of dying white birch. BA 148, so fairly heavily stocked for a mix would stand. There's 35 tons of carbon here. This is just English units, no CO2 equivs or anything like that. I started calculating C bars. Now, remember our V bars, volume to basal area ratios, right? Why not do this, right? This is the one way to become numerate about carbon. Um, and it turns out they're very similar to cords. Like we use, we use this roll, four uh, square feet per cord, right? Uh, for softwood, maybe five for hardwood, right? It turns out that carbon is almost the same thing. This, this, the C bar here is the inverse, 0.24 uh, tons of carbon per square foot of basal area. So you invert that, you get the, the usual four to one. So this isn't, now there are other pools. This is the above ground carbon. You know, we always see all these big pools, but the only thing we're really managing, at least the big lever, is the above ground. So that, and that's what you get paid for. There's no reason, that's no accident about that. So there's that. Uh, uh, so we were after that fur. You can see there's the residual stand. This was a heavy removal, just targeting mostly. We didn't after the fur and the birch. 7% fur, we, there's some small diameter stuff left. Uh, and the red maple. Uh, we also cut a lot of the ags out of this stand 
sorry, the Uggs out of this stand. We're not high grading here. Um, um, and that's, that uh, becomes a little problematic. We also probably didn't have enough regen protection on the small fur because we wanted it gone on the other stands, but necessarily here, maybe you didn't make that clear. All right, we're gonna look at the trends in carbon. This is simulated by FVS, calibrated FVS, because we have remeasured plots, so the diameter growth is, is, is corrected in the model. And it's a great tool because you just add the fire and fuels extension and you get the Jenkins equations equivalent of this. It could be more sophisticated, but you can see the starting point there, 35 tons of carbon down, took out about a half of it, and back it comes. And that's, a, that's the projected stand development uh, with, uh, of, the, of the overstory. Now here at the bottom, this is one of the things that you also don't see very often, but FES does this nicely. That is the storage, the actual storage in, in short term in products and then in longer term in landfills. So you see, that, I mean, that's discouraging, right? Maybe 30% of that carbon that we removed um, went initially into some sort of long life products, but then that just declines over time to about a little under 20% asymptotically as, the, as all that material ends up in the landfill. The, the big difference, some of that, some of the difference, of course, is the slash, the tops that aren't utilized, but the rest is just emissions, right? Just as Ali said, you never, you, you know, harvests are always a short-term negative. So there's the top carbon footprint. You take the overstory carbon, uh, total above ground carbon, I mean, which include the, you know, the, all of the trees, add to it that uh, storage, and that's the footprint of that strategy that you've, we, in this case, just marked. Now, if you have to then, it's always interesting to compare that to the baseline, right? The, what would happen had we done nothing, right? Um, now that's a little weird pattern, and what happened, I just used, uh, the, the, it's a fix more keyword in FES, we can just kill stuff off. So I just, to, to, and it won't do this otherwise, because of that adelgid was killing the fur, I took it out over a short term 10 years, so that's why the blue line, but you can see we're still uh, way, uh, that heavy harvest over half of the growing stock uh, left us with a 25 year recovery period. And this is the metric that I've come to, as I, actually just in doing this talk, I've come to think about this, these dynamics this way, and I encourage you to do the same thing. We're never gonna be, you can't ever, you know, we can't compete with the pro-forestation advocates of the uncut stand because of, you know, we know why that's leakage. I mean, we're gonna be harvesting somewhere, right? Um, however, with the thing we do have control over is how rapidly that leaf area recovers and how fast that stand recaptures the growing space. And, you know, when I showed this to my partner, she says, uh, you know, this is a model forest. I'm not sure you're supposed to show this down at this conference. 25 years is a little long. You know, we like to kick our cutting cycles down to 15 years, and it's like, okay. Um, I, I was temporarily suspended from writing prescriptions, which that doesn't happen to me very often. Um, so I had to make amends, so I went back up to the office. Okay, well, that's no good, right? What could we have done different? Um, so I said, okay, we didn't have to go chasing down every last uh, piece of pulpwood out there. It wasn't gonna die, but it just it affects my, you know, Ugg's aesthetic. And other things, you know, we were, some of that stand was very irregular. There were po pockets of cedar that were over 200 square feet, and I just wanted to thin those, why not? But ha we didn't have to do that though, right? That cedar would all still be there, and they'd be uh, alive. So if, we, if you just cut birch and fir out of this, there, it goes, to, you know, the removal percentage goes way down to something uh, a lot more uh, palatable here, at least in terms of the carbon. Save more of those fir saplings, you get, a, you get a scenario that almost is equal to, you know, we cut the fur, take our money, take the birch was not a huge component. That's probably the difference there. So the recovery period goes back to a very small um, uh, number, right? And I even, I'm not even gonna show it. Now, we were talking last night, could you, oh, but you couldn't have actually marked that, Bob. You would have had to cut some of those big red maples and, you know, those crooked whatever, right? And she's right, I mean, I would have. Right, but I didn't have to cut all of them. I think so. The real world answer here is when I'm out there with the paint gun, we could have come a lot closer from what we actually did to that green line, right? By just uh, and and and, and it, it, clearly we had not even thought about this in advance. This stand is not high graded. It's a wonderful, you know, we go out and we're proud of this in terms of a, you know the old metrics that we all used, but just dialing it back a little bit, going a little more light handed. 
uh, would have made a way better carbon outcome, and we would have still, this is the, this is the most interesting number, we would have foregone 284 of that 800 some dollars by not cutting that difference in that wood. That's 7.6 tons of carbon. Here's the numeracy we get, we're, we should all be using, right? That's, if you do the math, that's $37 a ton of carbon. Now, how many, uh, who's ever heard of a sale of carbon selling for $37 a ton? I haven't. Um, that's maybe three or four times the markets in recent years that I'm familiar with. So, but that's, that's what they would have had to pay us to be indifferent about whether or not to cut a bunch of pulpwood and small cedar logs primarily, right? So that's uh, procurement foresters that are worried about carbon threatening their wood source. I mean, are worried about nothing unless carbon really goes much higher in price, right? So, um, so we, so economically, you know, in the self-interest of our own economics, we did the right thing. But however, you know, being citizens of the planet and trying to store more carbon in the stand, we could have dialed it back. Okay, here's the second stand. Okay, this is our stand two, uh, mostly northern hardwood uh, community with some hemlock. Uh, the large, defined by a component of large old sugar maple that were tapped for decades. Uh, and it is the only stand that on the property as near as we can tell that it was never cleared for uh, even pasture, even though the soil is fairly fertile being northern hardwood. It is the reason that we have the wicked pea plant here, the leatherwood shrub, which is pretty rare. You don't see this very often. Um, so the harvest here, this was cut the same time as the other stand. The basal area here was 132. The removal here was much lighter, 36%, mostly focused on balsam fir and paper birch, like we did everywhere here because of their short live nature. And here there was a component of pole size, small saw log beech interfering, competing with the sugar maple and yellow birch and red maple crop trees that we, we tried to favor, at least the eggs. We, of course, per usual, we also probably removed a lot of the UG quality growing stock, but not all of it. And we, of course, left some beach. There was none here to see, I guess. Um, the other thing that's noteworthy, we're standing right on a forwarder trail here, is if you pan around here, you've seen uh, lots of little stumps. We, uh, again, with an NRCS contract, um, using my backpack chainsaw followed by stump spraying, we, we eliminated mostly the understory beach component, one to five inches, anything that was left after the harvest that didn't get har harvested for pulpwood, we cut. Also, a lot of the understory fir here, which was old and rotten, uh, we didn't want that either because both of those are interfering what, with what you hope would be sugar maple regeneration. Uh, now that has been slow to come. You can look around and find some, but it's not very numerous. And finally, if we look over uh, here uh, in the distance, you'll see there were pockets of mostly beech and maybe some paper birch and fur along with it that ended up as small open gaps. So the stand was not uniformly fully stocked. And because those were dominated heavily by beech suckers, we did not stump spray the mature trees here, which was a mistake. We should have done that, but we didn't. So we came back uh, a couple years later and did some enrichment planting. This is primarily red oak and maybe some red spruce in these small gaps. And those things are there. We had to tube those because the deer pressure is high here. And those are thriving. They're about halfway up out of the tubes now, which is as good as you can expect here. So. Okay, again, the structure. Uh, the, the noteworthy thing here is the, all that uh, grayish uh, stocking in the two to tens, the beach, right? It clears up to 16 inches. That's what we were mostly going after. And we always leave resistant ones and everything. This was mostly diseased or not. And the fur, the, there was fur in this stand, the green and the, some of the white birch. But very little else. So you see that beautiful, all that nice uh, big old sugar maple. That's just legacy material. This stand is just really special for that reason, and we didn't really touch that, and we have no intention of it. Um, you can see here that all that beach is, is lower, not completely gone, um, and we're down here with only it was only 36 percent removal. Uh, 40. We've increased the sugar maple stocking. There's some nice yellow birch and ash in this stand, etc. Um, 
made much lower money, 384, but that's still a decent income, certainly operable. There's 12 species here, right? This is a very diverse uh, stand, and the woodlot in general is that way. The C bar here is, uh, what was it? Let's see, go back here, it was uh, 0.3. So because it's hard, dense hardwood, right, you've got uh, uh, a sort of a three to one. Every, basal, every square foot of basal area equals three tons of carbon. You don't need four. So that, uh, I think that's interesting. What else to say about this? I guess not. So here's the carbon scenarios, right? This is uh, gonna be a more optimistic, simple kind of 30 some percent removal back it grows because we have you know, you know, vigorous uh, northern hardwoods mostly growing stock. There's the storage, the discouragingly low storage again, less than 30%, add that back, and there's our carbon footprint. Compare that to what, had, what FES says would have happened with no harvest, and of course, you know, we're never gonna catch up with that really. Um, however, in the, uh, if you read one of the articles I wrote for Maine Woodlands, I actually, if you repeat that six times, there will be, the, uh, the storage, of course, builds up over time, and the, and the no harvest gets old and almost flat. You actually can almost equate things over a long period of time. I just didn't want to bother with that here. We're taking, you know, the whole talk to explain that. But only a 15-year recovery, I, I call that good. That's just, I think that's the sweet spot here. For, and that's actually what I think we've long been using. The people have been managing conservatively. Uh, saving big trees, growing stock is, I think the 15 year cutting cycle, at least up our way, is a sweet spot. So, you know, okay, now this is better. We, this is model forest, I'm back off probation, so we can go on here. Um, here's the third stand. Okay, we're in a, our stand 10. This was a 45 year old, uh, very dense white ash stand that had um, 75 square feet of basal area of hardwoods, uh, about 2,300 stems per acre. In 2019, the winter, five growing seasons ago, we came in and spent six days, the two of us, doing crop tree release with an NRCS contract, releasing um, the, the hardwood crop trees, 95% of which were white ash. Uh, this was, those were trees that were favored by the previous landowner in early cleaning, so this is what we had to work with. Um, the residual basal area here was only 16 square feet, so this was a very heavy removal, 200 trees per acre. Um, and again, mostly ash, as you can see here. This ash crop tree, just for example, uh, grown from 4.9 inches to 6.3 in five years. If we look at the canopy, these trees are really responding vigorously. Um, and not only is the canopy exploded, which is, of course, what you want with crop tree release, the understory has really developed amazingly, especially since we have a high deer population here. There, we've just tallied on in-growth of one-inch stems, and there's uh, three or 4,000 or more trees per acre, mostly of white ash, stump sprouts, and sugar maple and red maple, uh, which I think were small advanced seedlings that have now grown above breast height in the five years. So a very interesting story. Most of this property has been heavily, uh, the hardwood regeneration has been hit hard by deer. Here, there was so much slash, we didn't utilize much of this wood. We maybe took out 10 cords of firewood on five acres. Uh, the deer just stayed out of it because they couldn't navigate it. So all these sprouts have, have recruited and are now above the deer. So just a kind of a like an early shelterwood cutting in a 45 year old stand which of course was not intended we're really after the growth of the overstory um so that's the story here okay very you know compared to those other structures we got two 90 percent of ash here and a couple little sugar maples uh the biggest one eight inches right this is again 45 years old 15 tons of carbon way lower right just as, as you'd expect for these small diameter trees um, C bar down to 0.2, so again, because the trees are short. Um, there's a basal area of 16. I see Adam Cates uh, used to be an enforcement forester in Maine. That's actually a legal clear cut in Maine, although it, you can't make a clear cut from a cultural treatment, right, Adam? So I think we get a... <laughs> we had no separation zones here. It was only five acres. Don't worry about it. Uh, uh, but, so 16, now, so this is, I mean, 90% of the carbon is on the ground, right? And we didn't utilize much of it. There's what we did. This is what it looked like, right? Literally, up like maybe a week after we finished with the cha chainsaw lay down, we did stump pile the, the hardwood maybe four inches and bigger, and we winched that and used it. But, you know, 10 cords on five acres is a, 
obviously why we didn't cut it in the commercial harvest. It's a one stem we went around. Um, let's look at that. So there, I mean, obviously a big impact here. We didn't start with much and we took it almost all out except for the crop trees. Zero, almost zero storage, right? Because there's no com products, right? These trees are small. Um, now, however, we got a huge infusion of deadwood, right? I mean, I haven't been showing the deadwood. FES will give you that. And, you know, all that stuff went right on the ground. It's interesting it really picked that up and I think modeled it pretty correctly. But, of course, that rots away in five, five or ten years. That's all gone, right? That kept the deer out, so it did its purpose. But that's temporary. There's our no-harvest scenario. So another, this is like, you would like to think that crop tree release in a 40-year-old stand, how could we lose by doing this? But here we got this 20-year recovery. Not good again. Um, but stay tuned. Uh, we go. I, we got to go back and remeasure the plot. So we did, and we came up with a, just all kinds of interesting ingrowth response, right? Which you saw in the picture. Um, we're now back up to 69 square feet from the 14 in five years. That's 10 square feet per acre per year. That's that's a high rate of basal area growth for a, for a hardwood stand in in uh, the state of Maine. S we went from like what 200 crop trees per acre to 6,000 trees, and it's all that ingrowth. Plus, we picked up on growth. These are point samples. So when you resample, you have to pick up new sampling in growth. It's not the same as in growth into the merchantable size classes. So you need to do both. And you can see we got a lot of maple, there's more ash trees, and plus the ash trees are growing, right? So if we actually look at that trend, now, so this is where data is important and proper use of models is important, right? FES is not gonna simulate that in, in growth, really. It will give you sprouting, but it's not highly inaccurate. So, Another great news story, right, for silviculture, right? That's, that's only, what was it, a six year uh, recovery period, right? Once we tallied all of the, the, the new vegetation, and I imagine that's just gonna, that may actually catch up. So we could stop, I said, oh, let's stop here, but wait a minute, the reason we're doing this crop tree release is we wanna beat the EAB to these trees. This is, this is still a ways away from us in Maine. So we got this ash, and they're 40 years old, what are you gonna do with it, right? So, again, going back to FES, we'll just, instead of killing off the fur, we kill off the ash, and so that's what we get, right? So that's, you know, anytime you lose all of your, you know, a lot of your crop trees, it's no good. Um, however, then I realized, well, I do that in the managed stand, I gotta do it in the control, the unmanaged scenario, and because that was all ash, it ends up even worse. So here we have the magic, elusive case where silviculture actually beats no management. <laughs> Now, by a, uh, admittedly, a fairly bizarre pattern, right? And invoking the emerald ash boar in, in heavy crop tree leaves, a lot of things that you don't see very often. But there it is. So th the message here is clearly the diversity that we got from getting rid of that pure ash. It's still 60% ash crop trees, but there's all this maple coming. So that now, because we did this early strange shelter wood, um, we, we c we'll, that stand will now weather the boar. Right, we'll salvage what ash we can, and that'll, and then we'll have a ma stand of maple and basswood and other cool things. There's pine coming in. All right, just four conclusions, and we're done. Um, so, and I could go on for days about this. So I had to really synthesize this, and this is my new thinking, by the way. If you've a lot of you have heard me give all kinds of talks over my career. I'm, I'm just saying that if you have the option, do not harvest more than 35 to 40 percent in anything you come to, right? If you, unless you have some absolute compelling reason to do otherwise. And that means, unlike what we did in that 55 percent removal, keep your Uggs out there as stocking if they're going to live to the next entry, right? That, that is unquestionably a carbon storage winner, right? And then not a sequestration loser, right? So you can't lose by that. Now, because of leakage, somebody else is going to cut that palm foot. But, but remember, we're building a, a managed landscape here one stand at a time. And every stand that we can treat that grows even a, you know, one twentieth of a cord more, multiply that by the, everything we do, that's going to be a winner. And that's what, this, that's what silviculture does. Um, so constant, on uh, your short life species, your fur, the stuff is going to die, cut it, right? And get your money. That's the, then that actually will be beneficial in some ways. Um, and, you know, concentrate on the, what I'm calling the short lived ecologically mature trees, the, you know, the aspens, the uh, other things, so you know what they are. Um, now, some of you, so this is making things more complicated, but i am become a firm believer that, of course, our, we know our natural forest in this whole region was multi-age, right? We already know that. That's its 
custom. If we go to old growth places, that's what it is. So why not transition to, to that? through, and the way to do this is not through single tree selection or some old fashioned methods, it's through the, uh, contemporary irregular shelter wood thinking, right? Either the gap based models or these continuous cover variants or some hybrid of those, right? And you know, I could, I could talk and talk about those and I don't have time. Base, my rule is re regenerate 1% per year. Of course, we're not going in every year and doing this. You multiply the cutting cycle by that, by one, which I think we can all do, and you get the, air, the area that you should put in regeneration patches, right, in, in an entry. 15-year cycle, 15%. You, it's simple. Um, and then, but then you have a matrix, right, between that, that may, may not warrant regeneration, or if you regenerate more just for the sake of doing it, you're gonna be in that situation where you got a long recovery, which is unnecessary. So, so you're maintaining that over the fully per stock percent of the stand. So, um, so 35 to 40% overall removal, that's actually, uh, unfortunately, um, I realized after I wrote that, it's higher than the new AFF program, right, which limits you to 20, as near as I can figure. So if you, if you want to just, you want to enroll in that program, then stick with the gaps, you can do it. That's, if you, it's hard to cut 20% of any stand operably, right? But I, I guarantee you, you can do it if you do it in patches, right? And lay it out carefully, and you have, of course, enough wood in the block to bring in machinery. Um, I can't resist thinning through the matrix in these stands, you know, while you're in there, and so you end up a little higher, but you're still gonna have that fairly short-term recovery, I guarantee it. Um, now, if you can't do that and you have that, you know, situation where you have these short life species dominating, then, you know, what, go echo Allie what she said, you know, try to avoid complete overstory removals. Just, just don't do that, especially where you don't have really well st uh, stocked advanced regeneration, which is the habit of almost all of our species. Um, keep as much vertical structure as you can. That first stand did have, that means big old pines, we didn't cut a single one of those things. And that stand has excellent structure, not necessarily full leaf area, um, even if they're poor timber quality. And you just want to avoid these extensive even age patches with no overstory because they take a long time to recover just above ground. And of course, there can be leakage from soil decomposition process if you open it up too much, right? Um, here we go. I mean, I can't resist this one. Um, if you must have early successional habitat, keep your ES stands that you have open, right? Do not make more of it from mature, well-stocked, high-carbon forests, right? Now, it, it, this is a free country. You can do anything you want. This is, but if you're going to put on a carbon badge and be the good guy, do not do that. That is a carbon loser, right? Is Dave here? We'll hear about that tomorrow, maybe. Here's just examples of contrasting gaps of stuff I just saw. I said, why did you do this, right? It's bare ground. It was a beach. It was alleged to get rid of the beach, but there wasn't much beach there. That's, that's a beautiful northern hardwood stand with this three-acre gap patch with almost no retention. Um, don't do that, right? That's going to be, that's a long 30 or 40 year recovery, as Ali showed in her chrono sequence on that portion of the stand. The, the same thing, there's a gap the way they should be. Some people say, well, that's not a gap. You've got trees standing out there. No, where is that ever written? You know, so we've, we retired from that 25 years ago. In fact, if you don't have retention in your gaps in, in this kind of an irregular shelter would set up, you have no retention, right? Because the matrix doesn't count. You only get credit for retention, in my world at least, where you're regenerating and when you're not coming back, right? So, um, so that's one of our, on our AFERP study, right? You've got uh, legacy retention, not that much, 10% of large trees, tall advanced regeneration. That's not going back to ground zero. That's gonna fill in, and we of course have plot data that shows this within 10 or 15 years from the understory, like we saw in that crop tree stand. And then finally, this is my sort of come to Jesus moment in writing this talk is that I think, you know, I'm an, I'm an old time forester, right? I spent my whole career out there going, suck, going after the Uggs. I think we really do need a new carbon ethic here that's on par with all the, uh, the traditional ethics that we had. Um, and I don't mean to be slavishly uh, driven by carbon, right? And, but what I'm what, really when you look at it rigorously, Storage almost always trumps sequestration when you're out there marking in the short to medium run. Sequestration is important in the long run. That's how we get the stocking we have. But the real decisions are about, do I keep that? Because remember, every time you take something 
out of storage, it's an omission. It's not a positive, it's a negative. So I'm not saying don't do that, but do that with a purpose that keeps that stand productive, right? That's the key, right? Always, and so just think more about that and, and as well, and not been, do not discard all the other things you've been trained to look at. It's just, just a little more issue. So choose things that manage species diversity and lead to recovery of stand leaf area. The leaf area is the growth factory, right? That's the key. So big open patches starting from over is not good. Little openings are just fabulous. Okay, thank you. Bob, a quick, easy question for you. Um, how did you measure the two and four inch diameter classes in your examples? What was um, your method? That we, we actually, we have a network of uh, permanent, they're BAF 10 mostly, plot, pl sample plots remeasured. That we measure to the 10th inch. So that's just the way FES groups them, right? We don't tally that way. We just, it, it'll just round it wherever way. So 2.1. Or, or say what would uh, the two inch class would be everything one to three, right? Is that? Yeah. What What did you use? Did you use uh, the length plots? Did oh, the, no. They're prison. They're they're point samples of five, four point six and up, and an eight foot radius sampling plot. You, you really need to do the hybrid there. Um, the eight foot just because it's easy to carry an eight foot stick. The math on that is like a two hundred and seventeenth acre plot. Um, and it works great. You plug anything you want into FBS, and that's nice. We started out using 100th acre. That's too big because you have to have a 12-foot radius plot. Some people use 500th acre. I think that sampling-wise, that's a little too small. So the 8-foot plot, I think, we is a sweet spot. Partly because you can just take a stick out to the pot center and just you know measure things quickly with a little plastic pole. And then um, and then remeasuring, you pick up. You re just re you know we you got to scribe, then you remeasure, and then tally on growth, which is the stuff that grows into the sample. Some people say you can't do growth from re prison plots. That's they just don't know how to do it, right? It's just it's totally possible, but you have to do it right, right? And that's the way you do it. So we have those data. What factor prison? Mostly ten. Some of the high we had some stands that were 200 square feet. We used 15 for that initially, and then the, after we harvested, we went to 10, the residual. So we're now down to 10 everywhere. Could you tell me like, how, what e equipment configuration did you use in these shelter woods? And if you're going to keep those advanced regen retention in your gaps, and it sounds like you kept a fair amount of UGS, how did you set that up? Did you, are you supervising heavy? Like, how do you get the guys to behave, honestly? <laughs> We could use that, Massachusetts. We use the Roosevelt. <laughs> Speak softly and carry a big uh, Biltmore stick, right? No. Uh, so th we take this very seriously. I've long taught, and we do this. Uh, boots on the ground, trail layout, 80 feet, of, 80 feet to 100 feet apart, 12 feet wide, and you don't let them get any wider. All cut the length. There will never be a grapple skitter on our land, right? We're not doing any. I would have liked, if I had more time, I'd have said, don't do any whole tree harvesting. That's also a loser. Um, so medium size cut the length. The forwarders have gotten actually too big. So, but we lay it all out on an 80 foot spacing, right? And then we mark everything, right? And we have zero damage, zero. I mean, literally. And th that for, that gap was on one of my research experiments done by the same harvesting crews. It's all Ponzi. Er started with Ergos of Scorpion now, King, with the Buffalo forwarder. You can do all of this stuff with, a, with a, no more than a 15% footprint. And if you, if you lay that out correctly, Boots on the ground layout, um, you can you the actual loss will be way less than 15% because they'll weave, you know, they and depending on the nature of the wood. So you just touched on part of my question and relates to whole tree harvesting. Um, we were learning earlier today of that, you know, somewhere around 40% of our carbon is in the soil in any given plot of land. But uh, whole tree harvesting will obviously remove a lot of that and maybe make forest products out of it, maybe not. Can you just touch on that whole tree harvesting versus slash retention? I'll let Allie come in here too because that, she's much more knowledgeable about the, 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 the decomposition. I, I just don't like it, for, mostly for the reason that you say. It's, it's kind of a needless carbon loss, right? Uh, you know, because it just goes into, it's up our ways. If it, the whole trees are harvested, they just go into a, you know, a biomass boiler and they burn. So that, I guess, replaces, then you get into the, you know, it replaces oil, all right. Um, 
But, you know, the, it's also, I just don't, generally don't like it as a, if you're managing a forest that depends on advanced regeneration, you want to minimize disturbance every chance you get. It's a rare case where scarification is good. This fall in your white pine shelterwoods is such a case, but it's not universally good. It's usually bad, right? Do not scarify out there. Do not over disturb the forest floor. And it, you cannot possibly do that with a big whole tree harvest. Um, yeah, I mean, I echo, I think Bob covered it well. You know, certainly you're removing wood that's not gonna go into very, you know, there's gonna be immediate emissions. Even, you know, those, those fine twigs and limbs decompose quickly in the forest, but it will be much quicker outside the forest. Um, and you get a lot of other ecosystem benefits protecting seedlings. There's, a, you know, nutrient recycling, um, protection of soil, like physical protection of soil so it can keep uh, moisture levels intact, right? When we open up sort of the conditions in the forest and there's nothing on the forest floor, we get a lot of soil drying. Um, and so, you know, that is certainly consideration. I think it's one of those things, there's gonna be trade-offs and making sure that you're choosing something implicitly to get the outcomes you wanna get, not just because, oh, that's what I always do, right? And so thinking about, yeah, are there, do, am I trying to regenerate a species that needs scarification? Is this a good seed year? Like, what are the considerations that you would use um, whole tree harvest? It might justify the, the ends, but, uh, or the means might justify the ends, whatever, <laughs> you know, things like that. But I think it is an important thing to think about, um, that whole, you know, what's happening on the forest floor and soil, which we, you know, something that maybe we haven't given a lot of thought to, but is critical um, in the whole integrity of the forest as well as the carbon dynamics. Hi, Bob. I'm kind of a fan of your, uh, your video series and uh, your, your regular Shelterwood uh, demonstrations. I know one of the things you mentioned in, <clears throat> in one of those videos was that uh, there are three reasons for leaving a tree. It's either a legacy tree, it's overwood, or it's growing stock. Now, Good for in, you. A in, plus. In, <laughs> <laughs> always was a teacher's pet. Anyways, yeah. um, so to... to implement a carbon aspect into that approach, is, oh. is there something more than just um, adding or leaving more unacceptable growing Yes, stock? it would be avoided emissions, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so avoid the emissions that's gonna happen when you cut that tree. So in that- Boy, now I need a four part series. This is why you come and do this stuff. <laughs> People are always like one up on you. Great, that's a great point. What, right. I, that may, there may even be other things, but that's the I want to just popped in my head, right? Well, Keep that CO2 in the, in the tree, the C in the tree and not the, in the atmosphere.